Ms. Lisa Brown. Court. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, members of the court, my name is David Brown. I'm representing Tarek, that's about as well as I can pronounce his last name, uh, who's here before the court on an appeal from a sanction imposed by a grievance commission of one year suspension. Uh, in terms of the underlying facts, we had a very comprehensive stipulation, worked very hard with the attorney for the Board of Ethics to make certain that everything was in there, all of his past sins and transgressions, everything that was here as part of this case. And so here it is, and the question is, how much? What's gonna be the sanction? Uh, interestingly enough, when we, when, we, when we got to the case, we went to the trial, uh, he is from Iowa City, was residing at that time in Denver, getting an LLM in taxation, uh, wanted to have family there for support. He's not married, he's divorced. And his parents sought to be part of this, at least be present. And you might have seen that in the transcript. They were removed. Uh, never will understand that ruling. Uh, but that's kind of how this case started. Then when we have stipulated facts as to what did occur and the arrest, alcohol, guilty plea, sentence, case over for reasons, again, I still don't know, because I did object to this as not relevant, in came Iowa City police officers. So we had their testimony, which I think was a, an attempt to inflame the panel, actually, on undisputed facts. And so now we finally get to my client, or our client. And I have Tyler Smith here with me, recent graduate of Drake Law School, recent admittee in September of the bar, his first time on this side of the rail, and wanted, uh, wanted to recognize that he helped a lot on this uh, briefing. But in any event, as to Tarek, where is he? 44 years old, has kind of an interesting history of education, only person I've ever met who actually got a degree, Cairo University, uh, multiple language expertise, military record, done a lot of good things uh, before he attempted to go to law school. Went to Creighton uh, for a year, finished I think at Drake, and then had a practice for a brief time, I think with Joel Holland in Iowa City, uh, and then at some point uh, I wasn't practicing. But in this situation, what we're looking at are really undisputed facts involving personal behavior, uh, not saying that is a good thing. He wasn't blaming this on his former wife. He wasn't blaming this on bad cases or bad outcomes or bad judges or bad anybody. He took full responsibility for it uh, and actually so testified. If you look through the transcript in detail, and I, I always assume all seven of you do, uh, he presented straightforward. He thanked uh, his accusers. He was polite within the context uh, of a record. Obviously, we don't have a videotape. Uh, and yet, when we get a ruling, the ruling suggests he was cavalier, that he was presumptive, that there's nothing to suggest that he's remorseful. Even though the stipulation says he is, and even though the written word on the transcript is pretty clear that he was, and that he is and that these are things, he comes from a very pretty prominent family in Iowa City. Both of his parents, retired now, are medical professionals. He's, he's grown up a certain way and he knows he's let down a standard. Uh, I know, uh, Justice Zeiger, you know him. Uh, you, we have a prior opinion in one of his missteps, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but you also were the author of the case I think is most similar to this one which is the Cannon case. And we both know him, and I know him, and I represented him. In fact, indicated on the, on the face of the argument, if you take the opinion, the Cannon opinion, and take the facts in this case, Pete did a, a lot more uh, kind of aberrant behavior, you might say, than anything Tarek has ever done in his life. And at the end of the day, the, the commission, I think in that case, recommended a public reprimand, uh, but ultimately the Supreme Court, I think you all issued a 30-day suspension. Why isn't this case uh, line up with Marcucci, perhaps? That's a good question. Let me answer it the best I can. Marcucci, we're talking DWIs. We're talking a felony conviction. 
We're talking, and I read the dissent, which I, I'm glad the court didn't go with the dissent. Knew Larry, knew him well, loved it. But the reality is, that's criminal behavior, felony conviction, and, and basically, uh, I can't remember how, how many, many o, but how that's many? the difference. We don't have that here. We have- How many OWIs have we had here? Two, not felony how many, conviction. How many OWI arrests are, are in the record? Well, I, I think the record suggests two, not three, but uh, the reality is he was convicted. Uh, he has two OWI uh, guilty pleas. So I, I think there is a major distinction between this case and Larry's case. Doesn't, doesn't the interference, though, with the police cause some tack-ons, though, because of his, uh, you know, what his drunkenness caused him to do that night? I, I don't think so, Your Honor. I really don't. It an axed. I know we, we gave him two years for drinking and interfering. Yeah, you do. I, I don't think that's the same case as this. I don't think there's anything to suggest anything that he did uh, made a material change in what the officers did. And I think the fact is he's done everything he can to make amends for it. And the suggestion that he's to be suspended for one year for what he did here, uh, there isn't any basis for it. I think, yeah. the, ca I think the Cannon case is on all fours, I really do, and that's, we cited it below, we cited it in our brief, could you, cited could, here today. Could you clarify one piece? Um, I, I noted some dissonance between um, the, the commission's report and, and findings uh, and uh, the brief, your brief, uh, with respect to uh, the nature and extent of the, the rehabilitation, the treatment, mm -hmm. the, the commission seemed to suggest that he was less than uh, completely serious about getting the treatment promptly and, and doing what he needed to do there, but your brief suggested that he had completed it. So what's, you know, give, give us your, your take on, uh, on your client's compliance with the treatment protocol that he, that he undertook. Certainly, and, I, and I, I think you're aware, it's obviously not part of the appendix. We made an application for limited remand to have things in the record so you'd see them. Uh, but my view is he has complied. Uh, and the, the, to use the term cavalier, uh, that he wasn't really remorseful, that we don't find that to be the case, I don't think there's a shred of evidence supporting that. I really don't, still don't. Uh, I, th I think we have a, a young person who's made some mistakes, no doubt about it. I think he's prepared to go on with his life, no doubt about that. He certainly understands, and, and certainly if there was a question in this, on this bench of any of you, whether he's complied with what was supposed to be done by the county attorney or anybody else, and wanted to make that a condition of the, of the reinstatement under, under the 30-day reinstatement, we're happy to provide it again because it isn't technically part of this appendix, but we think he has complied. When does he expect to complete the LLM? Uh, I, th I think where he was was he, he came back to Iowa, I believe, uh, August, September, and I and I think he's I believe he's completed the coursework or close to it. He's working at Iowa City. Get outside the record a little bit, but he's hoping to be involved in tax work in the Iowa City area when when this process ends. He's obviously currently does not have a current active license that went inactive when he went to school, uh, understands uh, that he's gonna have to take the steps with the CLEs and all of those things to make certain he's current, uh, but wishes the chance to do that. Well, uh, let me just, and I, you can take exception to what's contained in the, the decision of the, the commission, but you know he was convicted of this in February of 2015 that was his OWI second conviction. Mm -hmm. They ordered him to complete the drinking driving school within 120 days, and at the time of the hearing, over a year later, he still hasn't complied with that, is my understanding, or that's what they make reference to. They also said at that time he was to obtain a substance abuse evaluation and follow all recommendations. Uh, that was in February of 2015. He doesn't do anything on that until March of 2016, mm -hmm. about 14 months later. Uh, do you dispute that that is the factual record here? 
I'm not taking exception with anything any one of the seven of you say on anything about this case. But but I but I would I would just suggest this, Judge. I and, think and maybe I, couldn't that explain part of the reason why they are taking the position that he's not taking this all that seriously because he hasn't complied with the underlying sentencing order of the court. I, I, I don't know why they would say he took a cavalier attitude or that he wasn't serious about it. I read the transcript. I think you have it before you. I think that he did take it seriously. But in terms of was he in perfect compliance, no one suggests that he was, but they used that as a basis to say he wasn't remorseful that he really hadn't learned anything from it. And I think they went too far with it. To suggest, based on these facts, he's suspended for a year. I mean, Mr. Chief Justice, even with everything that occurred uh, with Larry in the Marcucci case, with everything that's totally distinguishable here from that, I think I'm right. I think that was six months. I don't think that was a year. I mean, a, a, a year suspension here is just, I, I just think, very excessive. I think six months in this case is excessive. I think the Cannon case, is the most on all fours with this. I see my time is up. Thank you. Mr. Brown, thank you as well. Ms. Wendell. May it please the court, counsel. I'm Susan Wendell, Assistant Ethics Counsel representing the Attorney Disciplinary Board in this matter. And the board respects respectfully requests that the court uphold the commission's findings in this matter and the one-year suspension recommendation for Mr. Kwas's law license as appropriate given the facts of this case. The courts previously stated that there is no standard sanction for a particular type of misconduct and that sanction for a violation of 32.8.4b is determined by the particular circumstances of the case. How can you distinguish this from the Marcucci case? This case is easily distinguishable from the Marcucci case. Although Marcucci, Johnson, and the respondent all received a third charge for OWI, Marcucci and Johnson entered guilty pleas to that charge rather than plea bargaining the charge down to a second OWI. However, respondent did plead guilty three times to committing an OWI offense. Unlike respondent, the attorneys in Marcucci and Johnson engaged in extensive rehabilitation to address their substance to abuse issues and to overcome those to make sure that this wasn't going to happen again. And the opinions indicated that they were both very actively attempting. Respondent contends that he's taken steps to ensure his fitness to practice law. However, the record made at the disciplinary hearing reflects that he did not engage in any of the lengthy intensive rehabilitation programs that Cannon even engaged in, that Marcucci engaged in, and that Johnson engaged in. And Marcucci and Johnson both got six month suspensions of their li law licenses despite those efforts. The respondent in this case, the record shows that he testified he did not obtain any treatment at all after his first OWI in 2011, the one he got a deferred judgment for. He testified at the hearing that he chose not to continue with outpatient treatment after his second OWI in 2012. And furthermore, the respondent disregarded the Iowa District Court's February 2015 order to complete recommended treatment and to complete a drinking driver's course within 120 days of sentencing for that third OWI fence, offense, which had been plea bargained down to an OWI second. Instead of complying with the court's order, respondent testified, and it's in the exhibits in this case, that he chose to travel, visit friends, relocate to Denver, Colorado. A probation violation report recommending revocation due to respondent's noncompliance with the court's order was filed in December 2015. Respondent delayed receiving any substance abuse counseling or treatment for over a year after the court's sentencing order. And the record reflects that the respondent had only recently begun attending counseling in the weeks just prior to the disciplinary 
hearing. Those are all aggravating factors that justify the commission imposing a suspension greater than the six month suspension that was imposed by this court in Marcucci and Johnson. They're all aggravating factors. This case is very much like Weaver's 2012 case, and I believe Justice Zager is familiar with that case as well, where the court imposed a two-year suspension. The respondent, Kawasa, like the attorney in Weaver, was criminally charged with felony OWI third and a simple misdemeanor. Respondent, like the attorney in Weaver, had already received a prior three-month suspension imposed by this court for the attorney's prior OWI and for conduct involving deceit, dishonesty, fraud, and misrepresentation, identical to Mr. Kwasitz. Respondent, like the attorney in Weaver, demonstrated noncompliance with a probation order and like the attorney in Weaver, where an untreated mental condition was deemed to be an aggravated. Ms. Wendell, as we look, as we focus on the conduct that's really before us today, uh, would you agree it's it's not directly related to his law practice? It reflects badly on his capacity to practice law, but it's these are things he was engaging in, shouldn't have been engaging in, doing in in his spare time, right? That's true. Uh, however, um, this court has held that in Marcucci, I believe, that the attorney's conduct um, does not have to be conduct that relates directly to their law practice and to be conduct that's subject to discipline by this court. Is this conduct uh, uh, bearing his fitness to practice law? because I think that's the real issue. It is, it is the real issue. And using the Templeton analysis, if we start with Mr. Kwas's mental state, there was no evidence presented on the record that he had any kind of medical condition or diagnosis of any kind of condition. Um, even if he did, it would not excuse his activities. The court has noted that there is a significant and grave risk of potential injury to society by operating a motor vehicle while intoxicated. So there is a risk of potential injury to a victim. He presented a risk to public safety by becoming intoxicated on the public streets in Iowa City. And uh, he approached and hindered a police officer who was working with a member of the public who was ill. And that encounter ended with his arrest for interference with official acts. As far as a pattern of criminal conduct, with OWI offenses in 2011 and 2012 and 2014, and then now a public intoxication conviction in 2015, he has established a pattern of criminal conduct. Only three months after his license was reinstated by this court, Respondent was criminally charged for interference with official acts. That was the charge amended to public intoxication, and a week after that for a new felony OWI. His repetitive convictions in alcohol-related misconduct, they demonstrate a, a disregard for the law and for law enforcement, and he was charged with interference with official acts after hindering a police officer. Law enforcement officers testified at the hearing that he was not cooperative, he was aggressive and interfering. And all of this, coupled with his disregarding an Iowa District Court order and a probation violation report, and choosing to travel and visit friends instead of complying with his court-ordered obligations, it shows that he does not recognize the seriousness of his conduct and its impact or potential impact on society. Can all these things you've been talking about relate to his problems with alcohol? They could. We, um, there is no medical evidence in the um, 
record as to whether or not Mr. Kawasa suffers from any kind of medically diagnosed condition. Did he, did he testify or is there any re record that says like if I wasn't drunk I wouldn't have gone up to that police officer or, or if? No, he never testified to that. And so we believe that um, the the um, the one-year suspension recommended by the commission is it takes into consideration the aggravating factors that respondents case presents that were not present in Marcucci and Johnson or Cannon those attorneys moved much more aggressively to address their issues to try to deter future self misconduct in contrast respondent avoided treatment for as long as he could and um, we believe that that this justifies the commission's one-year um, suspension recommendation it's not as long as Weaver 2012 which was two years but it is in the range and so we believe that is it's reasonable and consistent thank you counsel thank you mr. Brown Thank you, Your Honor. I think uh, Justice Wagan's question kind of hits on it. It's fitness to practice. Is it alcohol-based? And the answer is, it's pretty clear during a period of time, uh, Tarek had an issue with alcohol. There's not much question about that. He hasn't had an issue of any kind that's identifiable in any record, either through his testimony or anybody else, I think since 2014, uh, and actually, we're in a situation where no one suggested, in response to a question, I think, from Justice Mansfield, that anything he did interacted with his practice of law or hurt clients. But it doesn't clearly, his, clearly did not. Doesn't clearly his did. failure to follow court orders um, and, and do what he was said as a private individual mm -hmm. give some indication to us of his character? Um, if he won't do it as a private individual, is he going to tell his clients not, you don't have to do it? Is he going to follow court orders? I mean, those are the things, and, and I, I don't think there's any evidence to the contrary. It wasn't caused because of his alcohol, alcoholism and his denial of his problem of alcoholism. But those are the things that bother me, bother me the most. And then taking it to the extreme of, of interfering with an officer on the street, you know, uh, who knows if the officer might have shot him if he, he was making some kind of move, furtive movement. So it really, it's really bothersome that... Um, uh, these these alcohol problems have led uh, and has displayed his character of not really listening to authority. If I could respond, I think in the testimony what he said, in part, was that he was represented by I think a gentleman named Mr. Keegan. He thought he thought he'd worked through things in terms of compliance. He wasn't blowing them off. He thought there were there was understandings with the authorities. He testified to that. Mr. Keegan, we we did not call him. But the reality is he wasn't ignoring it. Is he late? Yes, he's late. Is there any suggestion he would advise clients not to follow court orders? None, zero. Is there an issue that he's had over a period of time, unfortunately, publicly, with alcohol? Yes, it's an alcohol-related case. And in terms of the interference with official acts, uh, and you read through the transcript, uh, I'm sorry, you the transcript of the testimony and you take a look at the charges, uh, I think that was pretty thin. I think they didn't like him. I think they proved it. I think they overcharged him, frankly, Judge. I think, did he have an alcohol issue? Yes. Is that been I, I, directed? I yes. To me, it, it really does go back to the, the lack of respect for authority, with, first of all, with the law enforcement officer there, and then also, and it, again, it just goes into the aggravating circumstances. You know, when you, you end up at a, a year later, nine or ten months later with a probable probation revocation you know he only had a couple of things he needed to do uh, with his sentence mm -hmm. and he wouldn't apparently be in contact with his probation officer and I haven't seen the uh, probation violation report in the record but 
you know, it's usually he doesn't, he blows off his probation officer, he blows off the responsibilities that he's supposed to be doing under there for at least 10 months, and the only option that the probation officer has is to, I guess he didn't have a probation, he was on self-probation, so he just, they gave him the benefit of being able to do it himself, he's not capable of doing anything on his own for 10 months, which requires the uh, uh, probation office to file a report. You know, that, that, that does show, going back to Justice Wiggins point, a, a real, a, a character flaw that he's incapable of following the rules and incapable of uh, responding and respecting authority, to me. Uh, I, I might take exception to that this time, if I might, Your Honor. I, I, do, I do think it shows some immaturity as he's in that time period. He also was in Denver. He, he indicated, oh, oh, excuse, excuse this me. This is not a young man, if, is he? This if, is not if, a young man. This if I could, fi if I could finish, I think he's a young man. He's 44. I think he's a young man. But, but, the, but the real, but the reality is, uh, I think he has done what he was supposed to do. Was he late? Yes. Did we attempt to put it in part of this record? Yes. Uh, could it be part of the uh, suspension, which we think 30 days is the appropriate one, and that he has to demonstrate proof that he's complied? Yes. Of course. Of course. Do, do I, do I stand up here and support? The timing of everything that he did, can't do it, not possible. But this sanction, a year suspension, is excessive. And when learned, learned opposition is citing the Weaver case, you know, the, we all know the Weaver case. That is not this case. I mean, actually, I think he was, Weaver, I think, was making threats. I think it was to his wife, such that she was a school teacher. They actually had to call the police to protect her. Counsel, uh, there was an indication in the record that in at the time of the interference with official acts, um, your client was engaged as a street vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know uh, the record shows he, he's been on inactive status for a time, at least when he took off to go to, to pursue the LLM, mm -hmm. he's been on sure. inactive status. How long before that was he essentially out of the practice and, and doing other stuff? street vending and whatever. I don't have a, a direct pipeline. I do know he was making arrangements to go to Denver to take the schooling, and he, and he basically had an inactive license. And actually, he was in Iowa City, good place to get out of if you grew up there and your parents lived there and you're unemployed at that point. And he's in the Ped Mall, and uh, he's doing this as a form of employment. Uh, and so, r literally, in Iowa City, he's probably in harm's way. But the fact is, I don't know exactly the time. No, no. I think those are all the comments I have, unless the, the uh, court has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. The case, then, is now submitted to the court, and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.